and welcome to Off The Shelf Reviews. I don't want to spend winter tied to this fucking couch. And I'm Gary, and today we're going to review and discuss The Thing From Another World, which came out in 1951 from director Christian Nyby, or director Howard Hawks. <laughs> and of course, straight away, there's some controversy surrounding who actually directed the film. Howard Hawks' production company produced the film, and but Howard Hawks had his name removed from directing credit. Hmm. Uh, a lot of the cast and crew would sort of say that certain that Christian directed some scenes, Hawks directed other scenes. Some would say that Hawks directed the entire feature. Uh, it sort of it hasn't really been, you know, the truth hasn't really come out yet today. But it would seem that Hawks, who was a friend of Christian, sort of gave him the credit yeah. so that he could continue to have. Uh, a Hollywood sort of director's license, if you will. Yeah. Of course, The Thing from Another World is loosely adapted from the novel which came out in 1938 uh, by John W. Campbell Jr. called Who Goes There? And of course, it is pretty much a loose adaptation which involves a UFO or a flying saucer crashing into Earth into the South Pole, the Arctic, <laughs> and getting buried under the ice where a bunch of scientists dig it up and release something unexpected into their scientific camp. Ian, why don't you give us the synopsis for the movie? Well, the story, like Gary said, is loosely based on the book. A group of Air Force men are tasked with heading to the North Pole in the film to help a group of scientists who have tracked an aircraft crashing into the ice. They come across the UFO and try to excavated with thermite charges, unknowingly blowing up the whole craft. They come across the pilot who's encased in ice and take him back to their base. The ice melts and the creature, the super carrot, escapes and tries to populate the base with its own people. I'm just, I'm just gonna go, I'm just gonna go. I love the thing series uh, and I wanted to start with this one before we got to the other two movies in the series because well this is where this is technically where it all began you know like Gary said it started with the novel Who Goes There by by John W. Campbell and you know the novel is about a really vicious alien creature coming to earth and just assimilating everything but for for a short story, you know, it just doesn't... There are some aspects which don't adapt very well to screen. The 1951 movie, though, is... is I think I think is a sci-fi classic. You know, it goes up there with, with The Day the Earth Stood Still. And at the same year it came out, When Worlds Collide. And, and other films, you know, like Forbidden Planet. And Earth vs. the Flying Saucers. I mean, this film's not Oscar winning or amazing. But it has something, you know. We start with 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 Captain Hendry and his co-pilot and his navigator at Anchorage in Alaska, and they're tasked with this mission to head to the North Pole and 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 check out these scientists led by Doctor Carrington. And I just, yeah, once once you got all the set pieces, the the sno the snowy aspect of Alaska and the North Pole, and just just. I'm just, I'm just loving this movie at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> the film does a great job of building up the atmosphere from the get-go. Of course, we do have the most icon, one of the most iconic features about the Thing movies is the opening title crawl. Yeah. Just the, just the image of the Thing from Another World text slowly burning itself onto the screen. Yeah. It's one of the most impressive '50s intros to any movie of the era. And, accompany, and accompanying it is some, um, what I would consider by today's standards, a bit bombastic, over-the-top musical score. Yeah. But it does just put you in your seat. It does sort of just build you into the atmosphere straight away. And when you're seeing the plane just sort of flying around Alaska, yeah. there's no music, of course, in my head. All mm. I can hear is, boom, boom. <laughs> yeah. Boom, boom. <laughs> I got that when they were doing the, the kind of overhead view of the base. You yeah. know, the planes going, hey, and they're looking down like, hey, look, there's the base. We'll be landing there in a minute. And I'm looking at the base going, boom, boom. Six to eight degrees difference, Pat. We're quite a bit off here, Tex. You better home in on me. I'll leave the key open. 
Or would you rather have me sing to you? Leave the key open. I was afraid you'd say that. You can't help it. You can't, you can't help it. But I mean, th this is what I love about this film as well. I mean, John Carpenter. John Carpenter would go on to say that obviously he he took his idea for his 1982 version, which we will review at some point, from seeing Howard Hawks's version when well, he was very young. We knew that Carpenter was a huge fan of Hawks's version of the thing because in the movie Halloween, yeah, the characters are watching on Halloween night the thing from another world. Of course, uh, Ridley Scott would also go on to say that The Thing from Another World deeply influenced him in all of his work, and you'll find that that's a common theme amongst most contemporary directors today. Yeah. They all would say that The Thing from Another World set a benchmark in sci-fi film storytelling as to how to make a successful suspense thriller. I, I Actually, I've only just thought about that, actually. This, this film does have a lot of alien aspects into it you know the fact that they come across an alien spacecraft they they come across this alien organism it escapes into their midst and it starts to to kill off the you know the the, the crew or, or the or the scientists things like that I, I never actually thought about that before but like i said the some of the set pieces are just absolutely brilliant i love the i love them when they actually go out to find where this ship has crashed you know, and, and you, they just stood all on the ice and they've decided to actually try and make the shape of the craft. And it's a, a saucer shape and they're all looking at each other like, yes, we've actually found one. Because at this time in, in 1951, you know, there was all words going out that you know, there were aliens and saucers flying around and Area 51 and all that kind of stuff. And just the excitement on their faces that they Come really, this? because I actually wrote down in my notes while watching the film that <clears throat> I didn't think that any of the actors gave a real genuine reaction to discovering a UFO for real and an alien creature. We found a flying saucer. Can anybody see anything through the ice from where you are? Only an outline. Nothing but a dark shape there. Seems perfectly smooth. No doors or windows. I can't see any engine. I doubt if we find anything we call an engine. They didn't, well, there was no, they didn't really seem to, to they didn't sell it to me, uh, looking back at this film. I didn't get a sense that they had just made the most important discovery in human history. They literally say those words, but I don't feel it from them. I felt it from, from Scotty, the news reporter. You know, yes. He was looking for a story, and when he gets up there, he's really excited when they come across the stuff. But he keeps getting cut off by Captain Hendry. The the the, the I Air like Force the I like the I really like the dynamic between the fact that you have civilians, yeah. you have the Air Force, yeah. and you have the scientists. Yeah, that, that's a that's a brilliant aspect because the scientists really really desperately want to study this this whole thing. And of course, and this is straight after sort of what Hiroshima. Yeah, and yeah. So we have scientists that are meddling with things which are incredibly destructive. Yeah. And then yeah. you have the military types that are just like, let's kill it, let's burn it, let's <laughs> burn get it. rid of it. Yeah. And, you know, and, and not listen to the scientists. And then in the middle, you've got the, you've got the reporter who's just like, I want to report this to tell Joe Bloggs who lives down the street what's going on. And, and everyone's like, no, no, no. Can't tell anybody because, you know, we don't know what it is or we don't know what it can do. And, you you know, you're just like, this is this is how this stuff kind of works. The military and the scientists, even though that they bounce off of each other, will block the general populace from finding out about this fucking terrible thing that's going to be heading around. One of my complaints of the movie, though, is that, yes, they do get there and they decide, yeah, we're going to blow up the spacecraft. I'm like... They've been there for like 10 minutes, no. not even that. And they're like, yeah, we're going to plant explosives here, here, and here. No, no, that's, that's a mistake. They, 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 uh, they use the thermite charges to, to melt the ice. Yeah. But the alien craft is made of a metal which reacts violently with the explosives. And it is brought to them later on because they think that they've made a mistake. The military actually says, oh, you know, they send the message up. Oh, if you need to get the ship out of the ice, use thermite charges. Yeah, it just doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't quite click right with me that this advanced technological craft right. 
could be blown up with a you know, the simple thermite explosion. Well, what would it be made of, Gary? I don't know. It's <laughs> unobtainium? <laughs> well, I, but it's it's to hearken into the story, isn't it? You know, the, yeah. the, the creature is now trapped. I, I just found it particularly rushed. It was like, oh, we found the UFO, right, we blow it up, right, crap, oops, we blew it up. Oh, we found the alien, okay, we've got yeah. the alien, we hit the ice with an axe and we're back at the base with the alien. Yeah, well, it's like, whoa. Yeah, that's it. But, I mean, obviously, they need to, obviously, to move the story along and it's not like the film's called The Thing from Another World and His Ship. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's it's the impact, though. You know, you, you don't, ex- for a first-time viewer, you don't expect it where the you know they're they're so confident yeah we're just going to use the thermite to melt the ice so that we can get a better look at it and the chances are they've used these thermite charges a lot they wouldn't have used it i mean one of the military guys actually says it's it's was it uh sop standard operating procedure to use thermite to excavate things from the ice and then they use it the they damage the ship and then the ship explodes because of its engines Last explosion was the engine. Sergeant, will you try your Geiger counter? Only a trace. That's just residual. It's all gone. Secrets that might have given us a new science. Gone. But now the ship is destroyed and the alien creature is actually trapped. Not only in the ice, but on to our, to his standards, an alien world. They then drag the ice block back to to the base and i you know like i said try not to try not to go too much into it this is what i've always loved about the thing series is the fact of the big block of ice whatever is trapped in there you kind of want it to stay in there until you've got it surrounded by guns flamethrowers grenades rocket launchers and pretty much everything else tanks as well nukes but instead they just go ah we'll get one guy we'll get one guy to watch it for every two hours and uh, you know, and the the guys are like, yeah, but the thing's got still got its eyes open, you know. It's it's, it's like it's watching us through the ice. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of freaky. <clears throat> I do have to laugh that the way that the thing does break free from the ice is because <laughs> there's brilliant. one guy in there, and he 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 decides he doesn't like the creature being able to see him. Yeah. So yeah. he decides to put an electric blanket, which is currently on, yeah. and generating heat <laughs> over the ice. Now, I don't really know the real science of this, but I'm going to guessing that an electric blanket over a sheet of ice or a block of ice that large is going yeah. to take more than two hours <laughs> to melt it. But not only that, is that when we look at the block of ice, it is gushing water like a goddamn faucet that's been left on and the yeah. guy's just sat at his desk dee, 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 dee. yep just down can't hear coffee. it can't hear nothing just 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 <laughs> dwindling along i mean in a way harkens back to the kind of ineptitude of the military forces yeah you know he yeah. before he put the he didn't mean to obviously he just wanted to, to stop it looking at him he should have checked to see if that blanket was on you know he he, he should have but obviously like i said we're you know, it, it's it's the standard operating procedure of this movie. You know, the creature is supposed to the creature is supposed to burst out, and I love the fact that this, you don't see it. You don't <laughs> see it, but the creature wakes up and is you know pretty pissed off. And not only has it crashed onto an alien planet, you know, but it's been encased in a block of ice. And the first thing it gets out, it wakes up and gets shot at. By the guy, <laughs> I'd be fucking pissed off if that happened to me. <laughs> We have Margaret Sheridan playing Nikki and and Kenneth Toby kept playing Captain Hendry and their 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 little love interest kind of kind of fills the rest of the film. You know, you kind of just want to see the thing attacking the military and attacking the scientists. But obviously we're talking nineteen fifty one, every film at this point had love interests and and this is what we get from Nikki and Captain Hendry. But I do the multiple times that I watch it, I do warm to them very easily because they they discuss things that have happened before they've come to the North Pole 
And it just feels so natural the way that they're talking about them drinking and, and how they, you know, they had a laugh and they, he wanted to kiss her, but she wouldn't let him. And then as the film develops, there's that whole sequence where she tied him up and he sat on the chair and she's kind of force feeding him drinks. I was like, okay, this is just filler, but I'd like a girl to do that to me sometimes. <laughs> I found that the dialogue in the film was razor sharp. I thought it was witty and playful and pretty damn enjoyable. Yeah. And for me, that was one of the driving forces to of enjoying the entire film. From the get-go, you can tell that this film is vastly different from all the other films uh, of its time because the actors do such a good job in their performance of, of delivering their dialogue and it's uh, it's a staple of the di- of director of Howard Hawks in the fact that he will have his actors talk over the top of each other. Oh yeah, I love that. He will have your two main actors on front of the screen talking, and actors behind them having a completely different conversation. And so it gives this film an air of documentary esque sort of lifelike nature, yeah. which is totally different from all the other films, especially in the sci-fi genre, and especially in the 50s. I'm going out to check the ship and tie it down good. We'll need our gear, too. This storm may blow for a couple of weeks. Get some of those Eskimos to help you. Oh, they took off and they saw that cake of ice. They'll need a lot of cokes and they get them back. I thought if Mr. Scott and the lieutenant would give me a hand... I well, thought I was a guest. I thought an officer... Oh, you can be ordering guest. me around while you're carrying the other end, sir. That'll help a lot, sir. The first time I watched this, they kind of threw me off. I was just like, are they... Are they messing up their lines, talking over each other? You know, because I'm trying to hear the main actor, but I'm, I'm listening to Scotty in the background doing his thing. But then the multiple times I'm watching it, it, it gets a more realistic appeal. This is how people would react in a tense situation. They would talk over each other. They would discuss different ideas. They would, they would just force each other down. You know, there's points where Hendry is talking to Carrington and Carrington is trying to explain it in scientific terms. And Hendry's just like, stop. You know, talk to me like I'm talk to me like I'm a normal person, please, because, you know, we're getting dead bodies up here, and and I, I want to kill this thing, and you want to fucking make friends with it. You know, <laughs> that's not gonna work. <laughs> so the first real big action sequence comes at about forty minute mark in the film, and we have barely seen a glimpse of this creature yet. Yeah. Yet, the alarm soon goes off when they realize that something is attacking the dogs just outside and because the creature in this film has been sort of labeled a giant carrot (laughs) wasn't very impressive to look at if you look at some of these still images of the creature you can see that he does kind of look like he's got a frankenstein mask on that's been turned inside out yeah and a couple of sort of enlarged uh, enlarged sort of um toothed sort of clawed hands so he kind of doesn't look very intimidating or very scary really so as a staple to all great horror movies it's a case of show uh sorry of tell and don't show yeah it's a case of keeping the creature concealed until perhaps the film's climax so during this attack where you're seeing this silhouette essentially just throwing these dogs around like yeah, rag dials, yeah, yeah you're just kind of like oh oh actually that that actually does look pretty damn horrific because you're just seeing these dogs getting thrown around in the air. Yeah. It's it's kind of... I'm not going to say scary because the film doesn't really deliver on the scares too much. But for the 50s, it would have been quite... For the 50s, I th- this film would have definitely been... would have been accessible as a family movie because yeah. it's not gory. It's not uber-violent. It is, I guess, what I would consider perhaps a PG movie of its time. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I, I, I get that as well. I mean, obviously, you know, comparing to a lot of films nowadays, it, there aren't any major action sequences or, or major blood sequences. But in the script, you know, the fact that when the thing gets attacked by the dogs, it loses an arm. And so they take the arm back to study it and the arm starts to come back alive. Because the blood it was ingesting from the dogs has has revitalized it. That, you know, even now kind of gives a shiver on my back. Because I'm just like, somebody actually thought that that was a really good idea. You know, using the blood of these other creatures to to rebuild body parts or to feed its young and things like that. I mean, there's there's a sequence later where a few of the scientists have been killed. And you don't see them. 
But the way it's described by Captain Hendry that Captain Hendry has seen these people hung up with their throats slit. And I'm like, damn, they've been drained like cattle, basically. Yeah. Like a, yeah. And I'm just like, damn, you know, the, the, the fact that, like we said, 1950s, you know, Gary says, it's a very PG, PG related film. Imagine your young son sitting there going, Dad, what's having your throat slit? And you're like, mm, no, yeah. A well, they're years. dead, son. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're, they're dead, son. <laughs> when I came to, I saw Olson and Arbach. They were. Give me some more of that. Get those axes. Go ahead, Doctor. They were both hanging from the beams upside down. They were dead. Their throats were cut. And so what's radically different to this creature of the thing from the book is the fact that it has the makeup, if you will, then, of a vegetable. Yes. Which, yes. I, which I find kind of interesting. I mean, you can make the metaphor of the fact that, you know, if you take a tree and you drill a hole right the way through it, yeah. the tree's still going to be fine. Yeah. Um, whereas so this creature, if you shoot bullets into it, it's, you know, it doesn't have any vital organs, if you will. No. So it's just one, you know, it's a, this creature it, is then... It is just a giant space vegetable, but we are talking about <laughs> a giant man-sized Frankenstein-esque space vegetable that wants to kill you and drain all of your blood. They explained that it has like seed or pollen in yeah. its hands. Yeah. So, or whatever it touches then, it can sort of infect. Yeah. Um, or sort of, you know, like a plant just sort of spread its its seed, if you will. And so anybody that it touches, I kind of got the, the you know, the idea then that if it just touched people, yeah. that it would infect them with the seed pollen and also turn them into thing-like creatures. Wherever in this film we see that he's actually growing plants. Yeah, Dr. Carrington has come across a few of the seeds and has set up some of the blood plasma that they have delivered at the base and has started to obviously feed it because he wants to study these things. But as the film develops, you know, the people, people a few people are starting to die. And so his scientific team are turning around saying, hold on a minute, we can barely contain one of them. What's going to happen if you've got a hundred of these running around? And, and, and that's what I really love about just the general thing principle in, in, in the books, the games, the films, all of them, is the fact that being self-contained in the Arctic or, or, or wherever, it's a case of this cannot get out. It cannot escape to any of the cities or the general populace because it will kill everything. We'll probably find it has a sugar base. Please, Please doctor, I've got to ask this. Scott? It sounds like, well, just as though you're describing some form of Super carrot. That's nearly right, Mr. Scott. This carrot, as you call it, has constructed an aircraft capable of flying some millions of miles through space, propelled by a force as yet unknown to us. An intellectual carrot, the mind boggles. It shouldn't. And I even though this, I mean, this, this movie obviously is, compared to the rest of it, on a below standard, really, it still gives you that sense of fear of, you know, you imagine this giant Frankenstein-esque creature killing all these people, killing two people at a time and wiping out dogs. Now imagine thousands of them. You know, they would literally wipe armies out. Flames, flamethrowers don't work, bullets don't work. The only thing that, you know, generally works, like we, like we see at the end of the movie, is electricity. But this creature is pretty smart and actually goes out of its way to cut the oil off to the rest of the base. So it's trying to freeze the people inside so it can wipe them out but wouldn't that also freeze the creature itself well the <clears> creature <throat> itself wants to be frozen doesn't it that's the general principle it wants to be frozen so that it can get to warmer climates i mean if this thing is a if this thing is a space vegetable i kind of wonder at its intelligence because it makes no you know it makes no attempt at communication all it does is make horrible sort of yeah. violent noises yeah and well maybe it, that's how it communicates and it walks around like a goddamn zombie yeah <laughs> but i just say like we said like i said you know it's it's in the arctic you know if we know we know from our own human studies that plants develop very well in warmer climates yeah you know with water and stuff like that so you know how how big would this thing be? How how intelligent would it be if it got to warmer climates? You never know. It gets stuck in the Arctic and gets fucking attacked all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Daddy, get back here! Stay away from the water! Listen, I'm your friend. Look, I have no weapons. I'm your friend. 
You're wiser than I. You must understand what I'm trying to tell you. Don't go any farther. They'll kill you. They think you mean to harm us all. But I want to know you, to help you. Believe that. You're wiser than anything on Earth. Use that intelligence. Look at me and know what I'm trying to tell you. I'm not your enemy. I'm a scientist. I'm a scientist who's trying... Uh, I don't particularly have... Uh... A favorite scene in the film. Of course, there are memorable. There is a couple of memorable action sequences. Uh, there is what I what I actually enjoyed in the film was some of its sort of dark humor mm. that kept cropping up every now and again. And of course, there is one joke that I actually thought was pretty funny, and that is when they're talking about the standard operating procedure of dealing with you know certain phenomena. Yeah, and. He brings out his sort of Royal Air Force Codex book <laughs> yeah, and yeah, lists yeah. off a serial number that's like 50 digits long. <laughs> and the other co-pilot's just like, oh yeah, yeah I remember that one. <laughs> Where'd you say the number of that bulletin was? 629-49, item 6700, extract 75,131. Oh, oh, that one. <laughs> yeah, I like, I like, I so like. So the, there's joke just a well. few little jokes throughout the film, which I just thought it is. It's not over the top, and it just it sort of breaks the tension just enough mm. that it's yeah, quite enjoyable moments. My my favorite scenes. I mean, as an absolute fan of the film and and literally the whole series, love it all. But I love the first time you you get a quick glimpse of the creature. They they found out that there's a few guys being killed in the greenhouse and. Captain Hendry leads his team up to the door and it, it's not really tense. There's no music building up. You, you don't feel scared or anything until he opens the door and the creature is there and sticks its arm out. And that's when the music kicks in and you're like, oh shit. You know, it was, it was literally waiting right behind that door for us. Um, I love, I love also the kerosene scene where they decide to burn the creature. I mean, we're talking 1951 and I like the way, I, I, I believe it's just one set, this room, but the filming leading up, you know, you, you follow the guys up to different doors and they, they, they design all these things. And then the creature just appears at the end door, you know, the wind and the, and the snow is howling behind it. It steps in, they throw kerosene on it, they shoot it with a flare. You know it's a stunt guy because the outfits change. But Just as a as a side note, I think that that is the first recorded in film history of a full uh, full bodysuit man being set on fire as a stunt. Nice in, in film. Nice because they set the fucking room ablaze. You know, there's a there's a sequence I always get scared because the creature sees Nikki hiding behind a mattress and swipes the mattress. And then, and she she puts it up above her face, and then the camera cuts to another guy throwing more kerosene on it, and literally the kerosene hits the thing, and just spreads all on the walls, and almost gets her. The creature leaps out of the window, out back into the snow, and they're now rushing around trying to put the fire out, and you're just like, okay, guys, fire doesn't really work. <laughs> you know, just, let's not do that again. <laughs> well, so much so that they actually almost killed actor James Arness, who played the thing creature because the oxygen tank that he had is 100% flammable. Ooh. So he was so very lucky that he didn't inhale the mixture and completely incinerate his lungs. <laughs> it was a very sort of troubling time for Hollywood stunts. Yeah. <laughs> and so, yeah, they, the effect, it, it still works. What I also do like, actually, is uh, maybe not so much a favourite scene, but I like the character of Mac, I think he was called. Right. And they have this sort of makeshift Geiger counter, yeah, which they're yeah. using as a motion tracker yes. to try and figure out where the creature thing is. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I'm kind of raising my eyebrow, just getting flashes of alien and aliens, just, yeah. you know, as they try and hunt this this thing down around the base. It's pretty awesome. It's pretty awesome. I I... I do recommend the thing from another world to film his to film fans to film historians because I mean this film has been inducted into the sort of film hall of fame yeah. if you will it's uh, it, it was colorized uh, a while back and. I do not recommend the coloured version of the thing from oh, another no. world. It looks bleached. It looks horrible. Uh, the monochrome, black and white version of the film, it still stands up today. There, there are some goofy moments in the film. You know, there's some 
you know, it's it's not going to appeal to contemporary audiences, you know, universally. Yeah. Uh, but on a you know on a Sunday afternoon or a Saturday morning, you know, you can put this film on and it will breeze by. An hour and a half will go by very quickly. It's still very enjoyable. The dialogue is still witty. The banter is fun. Uh, the the conflict between science scientists and and military personnel is is good. Uh, I I think you should definitely go back and have a look at the thing from another world, especially if you're a fan of John Carpenter's The Thing. Just like Ari said, you know, if you're if you're a sci-fi fan and if you're a Thing fan, you've probably already seen this movie and you probably already have your own opinions. Uh, if you haven't, go and watch it. It's one of those films to tick off your list. I I absolutely love it. I will wholeheartedly recommend it to absolutely everybody. But I know that everybody won't get what I get from this film. You know, they'll, they'll sit there and, oh, it's not as good as this and not as good as that. No, but on its own merits, it stands up very well and, and paved the way for John Carpenter. <laughs> Thanks for watching Off The Shelf Reviews. liable to become famous. So few people can boast that they've lost a flying saucer and a man from Mars all on the same day. <laughs> Wonder what they'd have done to Columbus if he'd discovered America and then mislaid it. Bunch of butterfingers.